going to wrap up our brief foray into the study of human language, uh, learning and development by looking at two older studies. These are um, quite old studies, um, but they are, in their own way, their landmarks. And they give you a feel for the kind of question that people working in this field might have as they approach infants. They are both concerned with the social behaviour of infants, with how infants respond to other people and interact with other people. And they also are useful to look at because they show how difficult this area of study is. They say never work with children or animals, and there's good reasons they say that. Now, I think these studies are worth your attention because they give us a view of the social nature of the infant, the emerging sociality of the infant. Um, and that starts from birth. It's not something that comes along much later. But the problems of characterizing that, of finding what to look at and coming up with some measure that's reasonably objective of what's going on, and then replicating um, findings from one study to the next, these are serious difficulties. So the first study we're going to look at is from 1985, so it's now nearly 40 years old, by Murray and Trevartan. And it's called the Emotional Regulation of Interactions Between Two-Month-Olds and Their Mothers. Two-month-old infants are quite young. They're certainly pre-linguistic. Um, but they play a lot with their mothers. They've, they're not just sleeping and pooping and eating all day. Um, the setup for this, this was done almost 40 years ago, so it took a fair bit of technological wizardry to set up this study. Whereas these days, we would have no trouble conducting a study like this because we're used to Zoom. You're all used to Zoom, I take it. Um, what they set up here laboriously was a way for the mother and the infant to interact, as it were, over Zoom. That is, the baby's in one room looking at the mother, or rather looking at a screen that has the image of the mother on it. And the mother's in another room looking at the screen that has the infant on it, and it's a live link. You can see the rather complicated setup here. We won't go into the complexities of it. This was very difficult to do 40 years ago. It's very easy to do now. But you can see that infant's looking at mother, mother's looking at infant. We've got a very, very early kind of Zoom call. And the way the study was done, babies came in and they spent the morning playing with their mother over Zoom. So you plonk the baby down, baby sees the mother there, and although it can't touch her and so on, they can play and they can make, and mothers work very hard at this, you know, trying to establish contact with their baby. Come on. Um, that's fine. And you, you do that in the morning, and then there's a big break. Everyone goes for lunch. And then you come back in the afternoon and you plonk the baby down again. And this time you put a recording of the mother up on screen, the recording from the morning session. So in a sense, the baby is seeing exactly the same thing. But guess what? They're not fooled for a minute. They know or they respond very, very differently to a recording, which of course is not responding to them, than they did when they were interacting with their mother. I'd like you to recall in this instance the difficulty of characterizing uh, anything as stimulus and response. If we are stimulus response thinkers, like Pavlov was, then we'd say, but the stimulus is the same in both cases. But believe you me, the babies are not fooled at all. They interact happily with the mother in a live condition, but when you just give them the recording, they're not interested, they're bored, they get distressed, and so on. So clearly they're sensitive to this live reciprocal coupling with the mother. That's a basic finding, and there's absolutely no contesting that basic finding. But turning it into a, the kind of thing you can report in a journal turns out to be a difficult interpretive exercise. So similar studies have varied the methods and found slightly different things. So the basic finding is uncontested, but the manner in which it's reported, the manner in which you as it were, try to measure infant satisfaction, measure engagement, those are still unsettled questions. And so those are the kind of difficulties we run into. The second study we're going to look at is even older. It's from 1977, and it's by Meltzoff and Moore. And 
as with all, always with these older studies, we're looking at researchers who are going to make the best use of the technology of their time. As we saw with the Human Speech Home Project, which made use of the ability to video record, audio record, store huge amounts of data and so on. Back in 1977, what they had available, and pretty much for the first time, was a Super 8 film. <laughs> they had little film on a reel, which they could film infants with. And in this particular instance, what they did was they filmed both the psychologists and the infants as the psychologists played with the infants. Specifically, as the psychologists made funny faces at the infant and did funny things with his or her hands. Making use of this was difficult. What the experimenters had to do after filming such a very human situation was go back frame by frame and try and score each frame of the video. What they were looking for is does the infant imitate the researcher? Now, in this case, these infants were even younger than in the previous one. They're only two to three weeks old. They have no idea that they own a face. <laughs> you think you own a face. You've seen it in mirrors. Other people have commented on it. In a sense, you've never seen it. But these infants definitely have no idea that they have a face. Um, yet there was findings, it seemed, that they were imitating certain facial gestures and certain hand gestures of the experimenter. Now, the experimenters made claims that, I think, th was it three... Three facial gestures, those three shown there, tongue protrusion, mouth opening, and lip pursing, were imitated reliably by the child. And they also claimed two hand gestures were reliably imitated. This set off a flurry of work in which other people tried to obtain the same findings. And here we see the difficulty again, the difficulty in finding a correct way to describe something and to be to score it as an imitation or not an imitation. Um, there's been many studies since, and most of the results obtained here have not stood the test of water. There's one exception, and that's the tongue protrusion. That seems to be fairly reliable. Children are not machines, but they will, in general, respond. If you stick your tongue out, they may stick their tongue out in return. This finding has even been found with very young chimpanzees responding to human faces. But it stops very quickly in chimpanzees, presumably because the chimpanzee is no longer... has, has sort of cottoned on that, hang on, that's not my mother. <laughs> um, and this study raises, once more, makes us aware of some of the problems that come with this area. In this case, they wanted to study imitation, but the adult and the infant have completely different, well, very different physical form. So how do you, what criteria do you use to say that something is or is not an imitation? That question itself is a problem. It arises also in considering animal behaviors. It's known as the correspondence problem. Um, it's not a trivial problem. So you can see that working with infants is difficult. We tend to ask questions that draw us into these very affective human uh, social situations and our ability to make measurements, score things and make strong pronouncements is kind of limited. And we're always doing this using the most recent technology available to us. So our hunger to ask questions in this area is very real.